grace to you and peace from the God of hospitality and forgiveness. In just a few moments, we will welcome nine new members at Grace and Peace. Of course, the term new members is a little misleading because all of you have already become a part of this community in ways that matter much more deeply than just a label. All nine of you have been worshiping here for quite some time, for weeks, months, even years. And that's only one part of what it means to belong to a church. To be part of a church also means to attend to the equally important and often more difficult task of fellowship. Getting to know the folks around you, sipping coffee, swapping stories, shaking hands. I've seen all of you doing these things too, and that matters deeply. These little gestures of hospitality given and received are in fact holy gestures, and they signal the presence of God. And so whether today you are a new member or an old member or a visitor, I hope you know that your presence here in this place nourishes and strengthens the group of people who are gathered here. You are already a part of what makes grace and peace what it is. And without you, it would be something different. So I think it's appropriate that on the day when we officially welcome our new members, our gospel lesson has to do with what it means to be a community in Christ. Today's passage picks up right where we left off last week in the Gospel of Luke. Last week, Jesus offered some warnings for those who would follow him. Warnings that a life of discipleship will be difficult, that the disciples will not always be welcomed, and that they will need to sacrifice for the sake of their neighbors. Now you might think that warnings like this would deter any would-be disciples from following Jesus, but immediately following Jesus' warnings from last week come today's passage, where Jesus sends 70 disciples out into the world to preach and teach. That means that at least 70 people heard Jesus' sales pitch that they would have nowhere to lay their heads, and they said, sign me up anyway. So in many ways, this is a story about new recruits, and it's a story with some difficult instructions. You see, Jesus tells the disciples that he is sending them out like lambs among wolves. They are going on a dangerous mission. And what's more, they are supposed to go with nothing. Jesus tells them not to take any money, not to take a backpack with a change of clothes, not to even take an extra pair of shoes. When they arrive, they're supposed to eat whatever is set before them and stay with whoever will offer them hospitality. I think these are hard instructions because I don't know about you, but if I'm going out on an arduous work trip, I would feel better if I knew that I could at least have a carry-on, a per diem, and a hotel reservation. But of course, Jesus isn't really telling them to go unprepared because they go with something else vitally important. Peace. When the disciples come to a home, Jesus instructs the disciples to say, peace to this house. Notice that this is step one. Step one is not to do a cost-benefit analysis or to size up the scene or to determine if the people in the house are in fact godly people. Step one is simply to announce that the peace of God has come even and especially to that place. It is a proclamation, a sharing of good news. And then Jesus says, if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. I think it's worth mentioning that the word that Jesus uses for peace is the Hebrew word shalom. And throughout the Bible, this word means much more than just calm or absence of conflict. Shalom is a word that signifies wholeness and harmony. It means resting in the assuredness of God's presence. When the disciples are rooted in shalom, they will see that those they minister to are not outsiders to be rescued, 
but fellow sacred souls who share in the presence of God. This shalom, this peace, is more than just well-wishing, more than just a feeling of serenity. It is confidence that God is with them. And even if the people do not share in God's peace, Jesus assures his disciples that God's peace will return to them undiminished. So when Jesus tells his disciples to begin their stay in a new place with a proclamation of peace, he is telling them to remember that shalom undergirds all their interactions. And suddenly, with the confidence that they have the peace of God, the disciples do not need a purse or a bag or sandals. They do not need to know where they will be staying or what they will be eating. When they have peace, they have all they need. And this allows them to be wholly present with the communities to which they are called. Jesus commands them to stay in one place, getting to know the people there, and eating and drinking what they have to offer, and telling them that the kingdom of God has come near. These are just little gestures of hospitality given and received, but they signal the presence of God. Because God is always there in the breaking of bread, in the sharing of conversation and good news, in the caring for each other. Hospitality is a hallmark of the kingdom of God, and hospitable gestures are holy gestures. That's why Jesus sends out the 70 with nothing. Because to be called into Christian community is to be called into fellowship. It is to concede that we are creatures made for relationships. If the disciples had carried a purse or a bag or extra sandals, they would have been able to claim some measure of independence. Without these things, they are entirely dependent upon those they may meet along the way. They can't get by on this dangerous mission without some measure of human connection. And Jesus instructs the 70 to rely on openness to the humanity of other people. That's not to say that the 70 can count on being received. Sometimes, as Jesus warns his disciples, they will be rejected. There will be no opportunity to eat what is given or sleep in an unfamiliar but freely offered bed. Instead, there will be times when the disciples are cast out with nothing. But Jesus has instructions for just such a time as that as well. Shake the dust from your feet, he says, and leave town. But still tell them that the kingdom of God has come near. Jesus doesn't tell the disciples to rebuke or curse the unwelcoming townspeople. He does not even tell them to withhold their message of salvation. Instead, he tells them to get up, forgive, and move on. And that's an important lesson for us today, too. Because there will still be people who reject us, whether it's for our faith or our actions or simply because of who we are. And in this world, it is all too easy to react negatively when we are rejected, to allow the pain to propel us into anger or bitterness. But instead, Jesus tells us to forgive and then to keep doing Christ's work. And that's good news too, even though it might not feel like it. Because the reality is that there are no perfect Christians and no perfect Christian communities. There will be times when we hurt each other or let each other down. A pastor that I admire used to say to new members of her church, Welcome. We will disappoint you. Because it's true. Churches are made up of imperfect people trying to love imperfectly. And that reality is bound to be frustrating at times. And yet, for all our faults, still Jesus went to the cross to save us from our sins. We are a people fundamentally defined by the fact that we are forgiven. And so to be a community of Christ is to be a community grounded in forgiveness as well as hospitality. 
It is to acknowledge that we will fail each other in many ways, large and small, and to go on loving each other and reveling in the grace of God anyway. That's what our friend the Apostle Paul was trying to tell the church in Galatia in today's second lesson. He writes, My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Restore a transgressor in a spirit of gentleness. Bear one another's burdens. What could it mean for us if we forgave each other's mishaps and treated each other with gentleness even when we are hurt? What could it mean for us to bear one another's burdens and in doing so fulfill the law of Christ that we can all only fall short of without the love of Christ? Jesus sent out 70 people to proclaim the good news, and when they returned, they reported that amazing things happened in God's name. I'd be willing to bet that many Sundays there are close to 70 people in this sanctuary. What amazing things might God be equipping us to do? To be a community gathered in Christ means that we recognize in each other something sacred and that we honor that reality by resting in the peace that God gives to all of us. So whether you have been a part of grace and peace for decades, or whether you're worshiping with us for the first time today, you are a part of what makes this church the church. Thank you for being here, and thank you for sharing in the work of God wherever you are sent. Amen.